Hello everybody, we're back, it's two o'clock um, and we're going to speak to our first guest talking about uh, Belarus. So thank you for joining uh, Dr. Paul Riley and myself. Paul's the researcher in residence here at the Documentary Media Centre, which is a new post. We've not even told anybody yet, so we're absolutely delighted um, that that's going to be something we've got here moving forward. So today is the first kind of event that we're going to um, apply that same principle rather than just the newsroom, the actual kind of conflict reportage uh, club side of it as well, isn't it? It's a new concept for us. So we're absolutely delighted to be joined uh, today by um, Alex. We're going we're to call him Alex, hopefully, but we'll get him to formally introduce himself. So maybe you could formally introduce yourself for us, please. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is uh, Alex or Alexander. Uh, I'm a researcher at uh, Oxford University. I'm doing research on social media uh, and politics and manipulation and also use of social media by social movements. Brilliant. Yeah, Alex, I just, I mean, to give uh, the people watching this an indication of what, what your research is about, I mean, can we talk a little about Belarus and all the similar stuff that you've been doing? So for those of us who maybe aren't as familiar with what's happening, what's been going on there recently, and also what role has social media been playing in those protests? Yeah, well, indeed. Uh, so one of the key topics of my research been uh, been uh, social media in Belarus, and uh, uh, Belarus is quite old and established authoritarian regime. So non 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 free country, non democracy, and it means that people communicate about politics in this country differently. They talk. They try, for instance, not to talk about politics if they discuss it, say, for instance, in some kind of official settings. Some, some people self-censor themselves when they share information online. And um, for a long time, uh, this country had quite established quite a uh, long-term history of, um, a protest, of, of protest, anti-regime, anti anti-authoritarian protest. But never before uh, this country seen that level and that scale of anti-regime protests that uh, we've seen over the last six weeks. So six weeks ago, an election happened, presidential election, when current president been elected for six term in office. So he'd been ruling for 26 years now. Uh, and uh, only, obviously many people were not satisfied with that state of affairs. A new generation grew up that were not very interested perhaps in seeing the same guy uh, ruling the country since they were young or even before they were born, he'd been in power. So we seen the uh, largest social movement emerging and the most interesting feature of that movement, besides its scale, its spread, is its uh, very horizontal, decentralized nature and the nature that uh, also reflects uh, kind of something we didn't really see much in that country specifically before, extensive use of digital media for political communication, for discussion, and specifically use of messaging platforms. And in this part of Europe, uh, a messaging platform called Telegram, which looks like a bit like WhatsApp, but also is a bit different from WhatsApp, was particularly popular. And it became one of the main information channels about the process, but also coordination channels. So uh, this movement didn't have much leaders, public leaders, because leaders in Belarus get isolated almost immediately once, once get, they get become prom, uh, pro, uh, prominent. So it resulted in um, kind of emerging of anonymous or pseudonymous leaders, people who hide their identity, but still are very influential in the movement. So they, co they coordinated movement and they also organized it partly on everyday scale using that messaging platform. Great. I mean, one of the interesting things uh, for me, looking at that and also how the more authoritarian regimes around the world have been operating, they say in the last 10 years, is this kind of denial of service by cutting off the internet. Seems to be, do you, do you think the, uh, the regime was expecting that to be more effective than it was? Because if anything, they kind of people found ways around it now. Maybe people are getting much better at that. But actually cutting off the internet isn't necessarily the end of a movement that is using social media platforms. Yeah, indeed. One of the first steps, one of the first responses of the region was uh, to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the protest was 
almost total lockdown of the internet. Uh, and we haven't seen that scale of lockdown anywhere in Europe before. So internet was basically down for 62 hours uh, after the uh, polling station closed. And very interestingly, the result was perhaps an opposite from what they expected. So the government perhaps expected that people would cannot understand what to do. They would be confused. They would not get out on the streets to protest. They, they would just sit and wait maybe. It's opposite happened. Uh, while internet was down, uh, people started uh, well calling their friends abroad, for instance, or getting messages from them through SMS, through messaging services. They also get um, other ways around like VPN, other technologies. And in fact, I think, and actually it's not a really unique result, unique result but I think both our research and research by other people suggest that uh, internet lockdown or shutdown uh, really uh, um, expanded the protest because people were curious what's happening. Yeah. yeah, and they get out and so on and they, got, they, they joined the movement. Like the, the Streisand effect, or you know, this idea that if you basically try and stop people doing something, that makes them even more determined to do it and more likely to happen. So it's almost like, yeah. I think after Egypt obviously did shut down the internet back in 2011, it's almost yeah. like lessons weren't learned in how authoritarian regimes might act and also what that might encourage. I think your research does talk to that about this almost uh, ingenuity. In fact, I mean, Telegram, I use Telegram. You know, it's, it's more encrypted than there's other social media platforms. I know that you have written a very interesting piece with others talking about this Telegram revolution, the framing of it, and how reductive it is. I mean, do you want to say a bit more about how that media framing of it can be quite, you know, perhaps misleading in terms of understanding what's going on in Belarus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Uh, uh... I, th I think what's happening now is really uh, uh, re reflects previous actually events a lot that you mentioned our spring, but at the same time it's different this time, right? Because uh, well, these days internet populations are quite larger, yeah, than uh, than used to be. And what we also see is also, uh, as you mentioned, like this Telegram messenger that's been used also to overcome this shutdown because it re it changed its it tweaked its settings and helped people to access. Internet easier. So uh, my research showed that about 45% of all main protest groups, about 30 protest groups identified across the whole country created about two months before the protest, about 45% of users of these groups, about 70,000 people were online during shutdown. So they managed to overcome. And uh, 70 is, is a lot, uh, is, is, um, is, it 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 about ten percent. No, it's it's not ten percent. Sorry, it's one percent of all internet users in Belarus. But well, uh, those users can tell what's going on to other people. Obviously, not everyone using Messenger. So, uh, but now we have more than a million people using those process channels, which is which is more than ten percent of internet users. Awful lot. Yeah, I think we'll come back to social media again we'll kind of arc away from it and then come back to it but one of the ones i wanted to talk to you about is the role of women uh, in in the protest this time round. because i think from uh, the, the sort of the politics that we come from uh, women are seen as less authoritarian you know they've, they've responded better globally to covid19 with their countries um so therefore you know when you've got a strong guy in in, in power uh, a, a female is almost like the perfect opposite of it but also this time we've had um, the role of ordinary women, particularly sort of the older women, we've kind of picked up on that in our media. Sort of, and the way of pushing back has been actually almost like unmasking the bullies. And then for the first time, probably putting pictures of up, them up on social media with their partners, their children, and saying, well, look, here's this loving family man, and here he is punching an old babushka in the street type thing. Um, it, it, are you... Are you are your friends or people that you're speaking to surprised about the role of um, women coming forward like that? Well, indeed, indeed, you are completely right. Uh, the role of women in this movement was extraordinary. And not just uh, all those ordinary women, mm -hmm. wives and daughters and mothers uh, of 
all of us say, I mean, as I'm from Belarus, my friends are also, and they, most of them take part who are inside. Um, but also women play the extraordinary role as politicians. So leading, yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned there are coordinators and they're actually men, but symbolic role, symbolic leaders, leaders famous and known across the world now. Uh, for instance, one of them, Svetlana Tikhanovska has spoken, has, has spoken today um, to the UN uh, Human Rights Council, I think. Uh, those women play an extraordinary part as politicians, as journalists. Most extraordinary work being done by uh, women journalists. So, well, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's partly, uh, well, uh, yeah, I was part of a survey that had been conducted uh, and asking protesters about different uh, motivations and reasons. And one of the questions we ask, how would you call this revolution or this protest because there is no name? And many people suggested it's women's revolution. <laughs> And why, and why do you think we've got to that point? Because um, I made a note here that, you know, I think you said it's his sixth term, isn't it, Yukashenko? Um, and I know Donald Trump's threatening to change the law so he can have a third term. And, and that seems almost, seem, almost seems absurd when you compare it to some of the other leaders around the world. Um, and obviously you've said there's been movements before and protests before. Why do you think now people are driven is it kind of they've, they've literally had enough and they've just been putting up with it before i mean is, can you think as a as someone from belarus is there a something that you think people say to you there is now a reason why that is mm. yeah yeah well uh from the perspective of the survey i mentioned many people mentioned three things why uh, what are their primarily motivations to join the protest movement um it's police violence police brutality uh, first one. Second one is uh, is rigged, uh, is absolutely falsified elections, elections that totally were undemocratic. And third is economy. Economy wasn't good, but Belarus economy was never good. It's one of the poorest countries in Europe. In top three poorest countries, it is listed, and it's been ever like that. So it's not. I don't think it's really something that people uh, specifically triggered this. I think what triggered this one is. Um, is something that happened before election. So we're asking people after election. And before election, I think many people thought differently. The core of the movement emerged during the COVID crisis and the response of the government to the COVID crisis was appalling. The number of excessive deaths in Belarus is one of the leading in Europe in, uh, as, per, as per capita. Uh, it's, 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 uh, the response was absolutely ignoring COVID. And now we see that one of the core protest population of the movement uh, is actually medical workers. So medical workers protesting every day now on the streets or in the establishments because they, they know the price people pay for this ignorance. And this is kind of triggered emotional side. And uh, uh, some people spoke to emotions well, bloggers, YouTubers, uh, activists, Youth media to spoke directly to people's anger, to people's anxiety, and this is what really uh, was different this time in this country. I think. Okay. I was going to pick up on that, Alex, in terms of the yeah, the, you mentioned that was police, police violence uh, that's a motivating factor. How has this been different than perhaps, obviously, thinking back to the ice cream protest 15 years ago and the, perhaps the first wave of protest? Do you think the police violence, the documentation of it on social media? or being shared on Telegram, for example, is that one of the main reasons why it's caught people's sort of emotional response and more likely to join these sorts of large-scale protests? Is that something yeah. that's different, perhaps, than before? Yeah, well, indeed. So uh, what happened, uh, I, I, when I talk about COVID economy and stuff, it was something that was important before election, when movement was, gr movement was growing. But then election happened, people saw again that once, a, once again and again, the elections were falsified. They had no vote. And, um, and then they went on the streets and police responded with unseen brutality. And never ever in, in history of Belarus, uh, live ammunition was used against peaceful protesters and never used in general uh, after the Second World War. Never ever that level of torture. 500 people have been tortured. Officially documented. 500 people. 
Um, I know some of them, yeah, and children as well. And obviously people learned about that, not immediately. I think they started learning after internet shutdown. So it, shutdown was lifted and people learned. And then the first people who went on streets upon knowledge spread about that level of violence were women. So they were first to get on streets. And after them, other joined. So males were afraid because they mostly get arrested fast and so on and repressed. Uh, so women re really triggered uh, kind of post-violence response. Uh, can I ask uh, my, my question, my turn again? <laughs> um, yeah, a soldier, long time ago. Um, so, you know, the Warsaw Pact and all of those days back in the, uh, back in the, uh, in the 80s. Um, and probably that's probably the first time I'd ever really heard about Belarus and stuff. Um, mm. and, and now we're starting to use now as, you know, in our media and NATO terms and, you know, Poland offering to support the independence movement and stuff or, or the opposition, this kind of the term buffer zone between NATO and, mm. uh, you know, a resurgent Soviet Union on, on the globe, mm. global stage. Do you see that? Do you do your colleagues, do your friends, do they, do they see that playing out on the street? I mean, are, are these sort of shadowy, shadowy people that became quite famous in uh, in Ukraine, you know, sort of the Wagner group and stuff, you know, are they already showing themselves? Because that was mentioned in one of the articles that we've got here on Monday as a way of getting the money from Putin on Monday would be in exchange for allowing more people with, with no insignia and stuff to come come into the country and start to influence it. Well, I think that actually before, uh, before Putin and others sort of tried to intervene, especially Putin and Russians, people really didn't care about kind of external, uh, external dimension. I mean, ordinary people on the streets. It was really about internal issue. It wasn't about any other country. And interestingly, before uh, society was very divided, like half would really think themselves as Europeans, would love to join the European Union if possible. But many people would see themselves more like uh, exhibiting sort of Soviet legacy, like part of Soviet society that already doesn't exist, but still they remember, mostly older generation. But now you see, yeah, you're right that, of course, there is kind of uh, security uh, kind of issues uh, within this situation and the growing sort of threat of sort of Russian interference. But they've always been there, yeah? Russians always been there. They've been... Uh, most of the people who work in national security offices, we, we still, it's still called KGB in Belarus. So most people who are highest officers of KGB, especially respons specifically responsible for oppression, I, I mentioned, those people mostly studied in Russia, they've been trained in Russia. So Russia exhibits a huge, huge influence anyway. Whatever, whoever comes to power, it would be it would remain partly this kind of post-colonial country, I'm afraid, of Russian politics until it, Russia becomes democracy, until it stops in, in exhibiting this kind of post-imperial sort of policy that it, 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 uh, it commands now. Do you think Belarus sees, sees itself as being constantly in the orbit of the Soviet Union? And so until there's change there, there's not change at home. And, and if, I mean, if, and if that's someone's viewpoint as well, to actually then put yourself in harm's way and go out on the street and know full well that, you know, the level of brutality that you're going to meet really must mean that there's a lot of frustration as well, isn't it? Rather than just an acceptance that eventually it will change. Eventually Lukashenko will go or, you know, it might be another person that's put in by Putin and Russia. Um, but, you know, there, at least there'll be some kind of change. It's interesting, isn't it? Interesting times from that point of view. Yeah, yeah, indeed, yes. Uh, I think, well, people want to see change and they, some of them really are risking their lives and some people lost their lives. I, I wonder, I was just picking up on that, about obviously there, there's an awful lot of social media videos and images and you've shared an awful lot of them on Twitter in the last you know, six weeks. Do you think that's having more of an impact on how people are seeing Belarus outside Belarus? Or is it being picked up within Belarus? I mean, what was the media in Belarus response to this? Or has there been a response to this? Or has it been more about over here, for example, or on social media, we're seeing things that's being relayed back almost to people in Belarus as people recognizing this brutality and the way protests have been supported. Is it having an internal impact for the media or is it more external through 
us on social media or even Western media outlets when they've reported it. Yeah, well, yeah, oh, obviously there isn't, I mean, uh, are you asking mostly about internal media or like whether people uh, check what's been broadcast? What well, about internal media? I mean, has abroad. it registered at all or do you think uh -huh. there's, again, there's not been that coverage of that and it's had more impact outside where we see it on social media? Well, I think uh, seeing Belarus also media system is is very weird in a way. So there is state media. It's television. It's radio. It's been monopolized totally, completely monopolized by the state. So political topics cannot be raised um, without praising the government. So you cannot criticize Lukashenko in on television on radio. People constantly self-censor themselves. I mean journalists. Uh, but there is also web pages independent from the state media that are doing a great job as journalists, but they're mostly web pages, right? So people who, uh -huh. television players still a huge role, right? But what happened, very interesting, so when protests started and people learned about police brutality, many, about 100, 150 people resigned from state television. Mm, okay. And imagine they actually have nowhere to go because there is no other television in this country. Oh, yeah. mm. Imagine, and they've just resigned. Uh, mostly technical workers, in fact, mostly technical. Mm -hmm. Few journalists, not many, especially if they've been reporting politics, but at least morning shows, not just one, but like three, there are kind of three programs. All morning shows essentially collapsed for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. There was just empty chair. <laughs> like imagine they're broadcasting, like you see yourself, but without yourself, like only, only <laughs> chair, only nice uh, surrounding. But then, you know what happened next? Then <laughs> Lukashenko called Putin and Putin sent his journalists <laughs> from RT, oh, right. from Russia Today. <laughs> and now there are people who work in but If you remember US scandal uh, 2016 when people identified weird use of English in some tweets, right? And that's how they established that uh, propaganda or, or my Russians been involved. Similarly, though uh, uh, television, uh, it uses a lot of Russian language, it's still different from Russian in Moscow, yeah? And that's how we identified first, that it's not, it's not the right journalist there. Wow. Wow. So for language. Yeah, but uh, unfortunately, it's still like that. Television is still monopolized, and news media, many news media websites are banned, are now censored, so not accessible without VPN. That's why most of them moved to Telegram. It's, again, it's, it's interesting in thinking about how Still on the internet for six days, as we were talking about earlier on, you know, has a very negative counterproductive effect for an authoritarian regime or a government trying to stifle it. Because almost they build up all these incidents that are then flooding on the telegram and people are more interested. And I think that VPN issue you raise is very important. This idea that, you know, you can try and shut down the internet. People find a way around it. And as Alex said earlier on, it doesn't take a lot of people to be sharing that on Telegram to build up when they share it with other people or show it another way. So it's almost like the lesson for authoritarian regimes might be to think before you jump to that. And also think again about there is a narrative there you can't control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, last question from me. Um, and again, like I said, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. It's really good. See, what, are there any other... Um, protest movements around the world um, that you've got one eye on as well that you think are informing or could learn from or be shaped by what you're seeing at the moment in, um, in Belarus? Well, in, in fact, I think that many, and in fact, I think even maybe most contemporary protest movements, post-Arab Spring protest movements in authoritarian countries, in a way look similar to what we've seen now in Belarus in terms of leadership, in terms of organizing. In terms, we didn't talk much about that, but uh, how people get organized on the ground, uh, how their core operators function. Um, it looks similar. It, look, it looks similar in Sudan very recently in 2019, they had uh, essentially a revolution. It looked uh, similarly during, uh, maybe not in, it's not, it's not an authoritarian country, but kind of fragile country, Lebanon, uh, 2019 protest movement. Very similar mechanisms we see. We see uh, similar mechanisms in other countries as well, in Turkey. 
in post Gezi kind of processed uh, uh, cycles in Turkey, we also saw, seen something like that. Some research shows it's, but it's, what it tells us, it's kind of uh, it tells us that, that if people under pressure, people experience the surveillance uh, of the state and uh, other kind of authoritarian um, pressures, they act, they might act quite similarly. Yeah. I think that's one of the, the, the most interesting things about watching any of these protests at the moment is we tend to have, uh, you know, whether they're Western or, you know, developed or less developed or authoritarian, they've always trying to get the population to think about who the bad person is. So whether that's another country or another religion or, you know, ISIS or Daesh or, you know, extremism. And of course, what you've got really is the, the most effective that you've actually got is to create a, a, a social movement that's on the ground to bring about change. So it's never going to be regime change with a toppling. Mm. It's never going to have the big conflicts that we've had in the past. It's now about bringing it up from the bottom. And really, I'm just thinking, of, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, like I said, a boy of the 80s. So I always think of the anarchist cookbook that you went and bought or, you know, you got from the library, which showed you how to make all of these things. Whereas now actually something like YouTube is almost how to make yourself a counter protester how to teach yourself some of this stuff is uh, really where we're at at the moment in the world, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, that's what we're seeing. And uh, obviously social movement is a great way of organizing, but also bad guys also use this technique as well. And yes. it's increasingly in the West, unfortunately, and it's uh, also shows this property of internet. It just gives a voice to people who were not really heard previously, who've been silenced. Yeah. And while in a country like Belarus, People who want democracy been silenced. Unfortunately, in some other countries, internet been also giving voice to more radical types of uh, or groups. I have one really unfair question to ask you before we finish. So I've already done this, the question, the statement, so I apologize for that. Uh, what do you think is going to happen next in terms of what will Lukashenko, how will he respond specifically to how Telegram and these sites have been used? But I mean, what do you think the outcome is going to be? Kind yeah. of the near future and beyond. Yeah, I, I, yeah. See, I, I was, I was bad at predicting this. I, I was, I was th <laughs> saying that nothing's gonna happen at all. <laughs> and, and then it's uh, every, like my life changed completely for the last month. <laughs> but uh, even I wasn't there. But still, I think um, still I'm a bit more pessimistic, and I think it's good to be prepared for like. Yeah, for negative scenario. Well, I, I believe changes will come and it also relates very interesting another topic, how kind of people get into this state of solidarity and uh, in fact also kind of national unity in very divided society. It's very interesting. Super divided society about this line of East, West and other things, yeah. Soviet, non-Soviet, democracy, autocracy, suddenly come together, mm -hmm. suddenly became one uh, rather than two or three or several parts. It's amazing. And I, I, that's what gives me optimism. I think with that kind of unity, there's much more. Never ever people would drag out detained peaceful protesters from police vans. Yeah. They would never really try to protect each other, unknown to them people. Now they do it. But uh, in terms of media, I think what's gonna happen, and also it's, it's also phenomena that come and I think uh, politics becomes even more localized and even more kind of digitized and rooted in these new types of platforms like messengers. We don't see really what's going on on them and uh, uh, whoever prevails, whoever managed to kind of keep communicating to audiences there would be, would be very successful at least in delivering messages. So, but we will see many interesting things, I believe. I think Belarus are gonna remain for some time uh, in the headlines. There's going to be lots for you to keep researching, I think, going forward. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time to speak to us. We really appreciate it. And, um, and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch again and maybe we could catch up with you in the new year for another event. That'd be quite interesting just to see where you're at and you know, what your thoughts are uh, from a, a reflective point of view, maybe, and how you're bringing that into some, some academic work. Yes, I think that'd be great. Lovely. Thanks, My pleasure. Thank you.